Hello everyone, welcome to my channel. My name is Joni, and today we're going to have some more stories from Reddit. But before we start it would be so much appreciated if you would subscribe to my channel, like the video if you enjoy it, and maybe leave a comment down below. These simple clicks would mean a lot to the future of this channel and really reward the effort that I put in every day. And now, without further ado, let's go. Update 2 Not only am I not sure where to begin, I'm not even sure what to say when I do. I guess the first thing is to tell everyone I did manage to get a very good lawyer. Her firm in general is rated the highest at representing men in divorce cases in my area. Instead of passing my case off to someone else on the legal team, she took on my case as her own. Everyone at the firm has been kind and supportive. I can tell they don't just care about getting their retainer and payoff. Nadia, my lawyer, has done everything she can to help me with my well-being and sanity. After agreeing to take my case, we went over the usual forms I needed to fill out. I listed property and all bank account info, as well as ballpark estimates of what Mary and I make income-wise. After explaining about the wreck and what I saw just before it happened, she asked if I'd had an SDD panel. I explained that I had, and everything had come back clean. She then asked if I had documented the infidelity with pictures or video. I told her I hadn't been thinking rationally enough at the moment to do that. She phoned a private investigator her firm uses and set up a meeting between he and I the next day. I live in an at-fault state, so while I knew Mary was unfaithful, I needed actual evidence for the divorce to go my way. We set up one of her staff to be the go-between for me and Mary's dad, as far as communication goes and to arrange drop-offs. I got her aide to go ahead and notify my soon-to-be ex-father-in-law that my ex could have the kids that upcoming weekend and following week. Nadia then asked if I had arranged therapy for me and my children. I explained I was due to have my first therapy appointment that week. But as the children had yet to be told anything, I was holding off on that. She told me as soon as I felt they were in need of any professional attention to let her know. She had several therapists she could recommend. She expressed what seemed to be sincere condolences I was having to go through all I have in will. I tend to dislike lawyers. But I do think I might have found one with an actual soul. She gave me a list of things to collect and do before our next meeting. Many of the instructions were identical to the advice users post here. So, when she told me to drop by the drugstore to get two DNA kits, I thought nothing of it. I knew it was standard protocol. When I got home with the kids that night, I did the cheek swabs for me and them. I sealed everything up and mailed the kids off after taking the kids to school the next morning. Two days later was Friday, and the go-between dropped the kids off with their grandfather for the weekend that morning. I went to work, and I was just coming back from lunch when I got an email notification from my personal account. I could see it was two emails from the lab, so I waited to get to my computer to view them. At my desk, I opened the first email and clicked a link. The result said my son Michael is in fact my son. I open the other email and click the link. I read what it said. I read what it said again. I couldn't really say anything. I just started shaking my head. I knew I had to get out of the office before breaking down. But I managed to do screenshots of both results and emailed them to myself as photo files. I went in my car and began bawling as the realization my daughter Carrie was in fact, not my daughter set in. I can't imagine having an arm cut off would hurt much more than losing a daughter. It honestly felt like my soul had been taken from me. I don't know any other way to describe it. I didn't know who to call. I just sat there crying and wishing like hell I could wake up from my nightmare. I downloaded the two files from my email account and texted the pics to my lawyer. Within 20 seconds Nadia called asking where I was. Work was all I could manage to say. She told me to stay there, and someone from the firm would be there in a few minutes. I ended the call and opened the door. I began to vomit uncontrollably until I was dry heaving. By the time I managed to stop puking and feeling dizzy, one of the paralegals arrived to pick me up. She took me to the firm, and as soon as Nadia finished with a the client, they ushered me into her office. 
The first thing she told me was that sometimes the tests come back wrong. She said she understood. I was upset and had every right to be. But she urged me we needed to test Carrie and me again in a local lab to ensure nothing gets contaminated. I couldn't believe what was happening. Even after catching Mary cheating, I just assumed the DNA test on the kids was a formality. I would have never thought my wife would ever be unfaithful. But imagining she was capable of having some other man's baby, if true, who in the hell did I marry? I couldn't even confront Mary if I wanted to. I didn't have concrete proof. Yet I couldn't imagine if the results confirmed what we highly suspected, how she and I would ever have that conversation. One of the ladies in the office at the firm had a blood pressure cup and checked mine to make sure it wasn't at dangerous levels. It was elevated and I did feel like I was close to a panic attack. Yet, I was numb and in shock at the same time. I wondered what was next. I struggled to grasp my little girl might have never been my little girl. At that moment, I was so glad the kids were staying with their mom. I started wondering if both test results could be wrong and Carrie was my daughter and Michael was my son. I knew I couldn't wait two days to know the truth. So, the go-between set up a time she could pick Carrie up the next day for a few hours and take her back to Mary's parents. We did the test in a sterile environment and by trained medical staff. There was no mix-up. I am not Carrie's father. It still took a day to get results, and she was back with her mom by the time I got them. But I cried even harder the second time, and I'm so glad Carrie wasn't there to witness it. I sent the results to my lawyer, and she called to check on me. She urged me to seek out family and not go through things alone. I got into my car and drove to my dad's crying the whole way. When I got there and saw my mom, she knew something was wrong, but couldn't get it out of me. Finally, I just managed to utter, Carrie is not my daughter. Mom asked me, what? But she knew she heard correctly, and I was incapable of repeating it. After about 30 seconds of silence other than me weeping uncontrollably, she stood and got her cell phone. She called my dad. She told him to hurry home, but please be very careful that I had bad news. I could tell my dad wanted at least a hint at what could be so bad. She just urged him to be safe and get home as soon as he could. He arrived in about 20 minutes and we all just had a long cry for hours. I'd console my dad, he'd console my mom, they'd console me, but we were all inconsolable. They of course asked me about Michael and I assured them he was mine. They both expressed relief and then felt badly for being relieved to only be losing one grandchild. They asked me what I was going to do. I told them I didn't know. The only thing that was certain for me at that moment was that Carrie would never want for anything she needed and most things she wanted. I didn't even care about potential required child support at that moment. She was going to be taken care of. As horrible as I was feeling for myself, I felt even worse for Carrie, being totally innocent. Did I want custody of her? Could I get custody of Carrie even if I wanted it? I began to wonder if Mary knew or suspected. I suddenly wanted some damn answers. I met with Nadia after work Monday, and she told me she'd met with a private detective hired to follow Mary. Due to the wreck, she hadn't been out of the house to cheat anymore. So, I wasn't surprised he did have recent evidence. But one of the things Nadia had me bring was Mary's old cell phone from out of a drawer at home. He was able to get in and access nearly every app as if he were on her destroyed phone. He found nudes sent and received to and from various guys. Tons of messages and sexting with enough admission of guilt in them to sway any judge. I was asked if I wanted to see any of the pictures or read the text. I declined, but Nadia and I did need to plan how I was going to confront Mary about Carrie. She thought it best to do it in her office if Mary could be talked into it. She called Mary's mom's cell in front of me. I heard Mary's voice for the first time, since I left the hospital. Nadia got straight to the point and told her she needed to meet with me to explain a few things. My ex declared she'd been waiting and wanting to talk. She was asked if her lawyer could be contacted. Mary said she didn't have one, but said she was willing to come the next afternoon to talk. It was all I could do to get through that next day without crying like a lunatic at work and yet pretend to be getting things done. 
I was barely able to keep lunch down, but I left at three and headed to the firm feeling nauseous. I arrived first intentionally. I wanted her to be forced to enter, sit on the side away from the door, and unable to try and approach me. I was scrolling through pictures of our perfect family that never existed when she came in. She needed assistance walking and was still in two casts from the wreck. I didn't have to worry about her trying for a hug. I thought she might be playing it up for sympathy, but we did have a bad wreck. I finally wanted her just to sit the hell down so I could ask her to explain herself. Once we were all seated, water was offered and the meeting began. My lawyer started by asking Mary if she minded us recording the meeting. She was fine with it. As soon as we started recording, my soon-to-be ex-wife began to try and apologize. I bluntly interrupted her and asked her point blank how many men had she cheated on me with and when did it start. There were enough confirmed hookups from the private investigator to know the guy I caught her with wasn't the first by a mile. She didn't know what we knew, of course. And I guess to reduce the severity of the incident before the wreck her plan was to only admit to what she knew we knew. I asked her again, rough estimate, how many men she had slept with since our son was born. Giving that specific time frame seemed to give her a minute's pause, but she kept trying to act clueless. She still thought it was all a game at that point and I was losing my cool. Nadia put her hand on my shoulder and gently pushed me back away from the table. She looked at Mary and asked if I was a good father. She quickly gave me a glowing review saying she couldn't ask for a better father to raise her children. I wanted to stand and flip the table at the way she stated her children. Nadia then asked her if the other father of her child was going to be a good dad too. As Mary was asking what other father she was talking about, my counsel slid the paternity results were carry across the table. As much as I have hated what my life has become since discovering her cheating, I needed to be there to see her reaction in person. She was obviously shocked to know Carrie isn't mine. And she tried to hit me with the hull, you're a father who has raised her, and I had to shut that down. I asked her who Carrie's father is. She looked down with a hint of shame, and I thought she might be protecting someone. When she said she didn't know for sure who Carrie's father is, Mary saw me truly break down in tears for the first time. I just couldn't take it anymore and lost it. Mary was crying but asked to try and explain. She reminded me about the postpartum depression she went through after Michael was born. I did my best to be as sympathetic as I could at the time. I can say with certainty I spent every moment I could looking after my son, so she could have time to herself. There were days she was so depressed she couldn't even get out of bed, and I looked after all of us. But I loved doing it. I loved doing it for the family I had. I remembered I had actually been foolish enough to thinking making it through had made our relationship stronger. Nope, she didn't blame it on Rebecca. But when she first got married to go on a few girls' nights out, I was relieved if not grateful. They'd been best friends for years, but hadn't seen much of each other during the pregnancy. Mary said she got really drunk the second time they went out, and she let some guy feel her up while she gave him head. She said she felt guilty about it for a while, for months. But she began to resent not getting to be young and free to be with whomever she chose. She told us she started hooking up with guys the night she would go out with Rebecca. Until the night before our wreck, she'd never not come home or come home late over the years. She claimed she didn't want to develop feelings for any of the guys. She claimed she always used protection and never slept with the same guy more than three times. She said she just wanted intimacy. I was dumbfounded. Finding out your wife is a filthy lying slot tends to do that. It was like learning your life is a reality show you didn't ask to be in. I wanted to yell at her but I was too busy calculating how many men she possibly cheated on me with over a period of years. Nadia asked her if she had any idea who Carrie's father might be, and she swore she always assumed she was mine. My lawyer pointed out that obviously something happened and suggested maybe a protection broke. When my wife confessed that did happen a few times with a few guys, I lost my shit. I asked her who in the hell she was, because I didn't know the person telling me such horrible things like she was telling me to pass the salt. I asked her when she started hating me and why. I asked what I had ever done to warrant being treated like she did. How could she do this to her daughter? I raged, 
She took it, knowing it was all true. After what she just told me, and what I expressed about how I feel about her, divorce is a given. What was a marriage had become scorched earth. The only thing left to do was total up the casualties. I've lost a wife and daughter, that's two. A wife lost a husband, that's three. A daughter lost a father, and a brother had his sister become a half. Then you get into grandparents and in-laws. Mary essentially destroyed two entire families. Her parents will not be okay with what she was doing. And I swear by all that's holy it will let them see all the evidence the private investigator finds. She admitted to meeting with men from dating apps with Rebecca and using girl time as a time to hook up. She claimed she never meant to hurt me. She swore she had no idea Carrie is in mine. I actually believe her because I had no idea either. But Deanna doesn't lie. I asked why she didn't just divorce me. She came straight out and said, because she didn't want to lose the security I gave her. She cried. All of it was said through tears. But I know my expression was of just scorn. I was disgusted at the person who sat across from me. I feel used, humiliated, emasculated. I feel defeated. I'm pretty sure one of the reasons she came to talk without a lawyer is due to the fact I own everything. She doesn't have much to lose outside of a small 401k. And my assets I entered the marriage with by inheriting my grandfather's estate when I was young. The woman I call mom is not my biological mother. My mother died when I was two from a rare fast, spreading cancer. My dad remarried the woman I call mom when I was four. I have known my entire life she wasn't my biological mother, and I wasn't her biological son. I learned later she couldn't have children, and raising me helped her experience that. When my biological mother's dad died, what was left to her went to me as her heir. But I couldn't touch it until I was 21. I studied hard and went to school. But I don't have to work. Fiscally she knows I will mop the floor with her in the divorce, and she won't be getting anything close to half. She is a job. She isn't able to work at the moment with her injuries, but she is a job. Part of me wants to punish her, and the other part of me wants to be done with her. Mary was obviously medicated for pain. Maybe that's why she was being so blunt. But her words just cut me deep as my imagination made them even worse. I asked if she felt any shame. She claimed she did. I asked how the hell we were going to find out who Carrie's father actually is. My ex-wife started in with them. I already know who her father is. Nonsense. I was not in the mood for some philosophical discussion about what constitutes being a father. Whomever Carrie's father actually is deserves to know, and she needs to know about his family for health reasons. The evidence the private investigator had found didn't stretch back to before Carrie was born. I asked her if she could find any of these men or had saved their numbers. She had the audacity to say the point of losing their numbers was to never see them again. My God, how did I not see that logic? I told her she might have wanted to keep his number to let him know he had a child on the way or she got an STD. I want my name off of Carrie's birth certificate. DNA proves she is her mother's child and not mine. As stated, I will support her financially on my own free will long past her turning 18. She will not want for anything. As for my son in custody, I'm truly not sure what to do. Before the paternity test, I was strongly going for a 90-10 arrangement giving my ex-wife custody one weekend a month and certain holidays. Now that Carrie is not mine, I don't feel right about pursuing custody for her even if I could get it. As Michael is in fact her brother, albeit half, I don't want to take him from her too. I don't want either of them to suffer. But I haven't seen Carrie since the test results, and I can't let her see me break down because of them. God knows how much her therapy is going to cost me, but I will have to pay for it. There's no way to know if her real dad can afford it. And my own therapy will be enough to pay for some shrink's new beach house. Driving home after the meeting, a huge part of me just wanted to end it all. It seemed like the most beneficial solution for everyone but me. Both families could go on pretending about paternity. My ex could whore around openly while spending my grandfather's money. And the kids wouldn't have to deal with any broken marriage or failed relationships. 
But by the time I got home, I said I don't care. Nadia is drawing up divorce papers and legal paperwork to have me declared not Carrie's father. That will make things take much longer. But I do not want any legal grounds that can force me to interact, pay for, or deal with offspring that are not mine. The legal team is doing research for ways to find out who Carrie's father is. Many of the ancestry sites suggest potential relatives when results come back. Right now, that's our first plan of action. Even if the results don't come back pointing to a certain individual, they might point to a brother, cousin, or another relative. Whomever the guy is, he may not be ready to accept a child he didn't know about. It could cause some anxiety in his life. But I doubt it will be nearly the terror I felt losing my daughter forever, because she never existed. Everything is just so screwed up at the moment. Nothing is stable. Chaos is a daily burden at this point. The kids come back to the house Sunday afternoon. I've never wanted to not see them before. But I know many inevitabilities will happen I cannot be prepared for. When she sees me and wants to hug her daddy, I'm not even sure how I'll react. Hug her and cry like a baby knowing she has not ever been truly mine. Tell her I'm not the person she's looking for. I don't have it in me to be mean to her. But my heart is broken. Like there is nobody to take this out on Eve and Mary. Because nothing I could do outside of murder would equal the betrayal she has done to me. That scale will never be balanced. She used me and spit me out. She deserves to rot in for her promiscuous lying ways. I'm destroyed and everything I used to love is too. I will win the divorce. Nadia and company will make it the most lopsided division of assets in the history of divorce. But Mary reduced or removed the value of so much for me it feels like she's already won. Again, I'm done with her. I'm left with a son she will try and use against me and manipulate. Some people really are so horrible they deserve to be put down like an animal. I made the stupid decision to have a child with one. I just know now I'm not the only stupid one.